I'm here with Norma Medlin and we are going to talk about some old times. This is to commemorate the 110th anniversary of St. Thomas. Norma, thank you for being here. My pleasure. So Norma, I would like to know some stories you would like to tell about those days. Are there stories you would like to share? Yes. Um, in the early days of St. Thomas, this is you know, like 1949, 50, that's when, um, it was a, it had been a mission for over 30 years, I think. And uh, the reason that they didn't have a regular clergyman come, but they had a, a man who was retired military man named Colonel Gilmore, and he lived in Los Gatos. And he used to come on Sunday to uh, conduct the service. So, but the rest of the time, there wasn't much going on. But for all those years before they had anybody at all, there were a group of women who kept it going, you know, who who uh, saw that the building was maintained and uh, it wasn't much of a building, uh, but it, we have pictures of it and you probably know about it. This but, is the house you're talking about. House, yes. Oh, but, by the way, do you know who, um, who, did someone donate that house or did someone purchase the house? Oh. No, I think they built it. Oh, they built the house. I think it was, a, you know, people, volunteers who decided they wanted to have a church and that's what they did. Oh. So it was, it was very modest. It didn't have a kitchen and it didn't have a bathroom. And when I came to Sunnyvale and I went to the church, I met these women and we met on a regular basis. I think it was probably every couple of weeks, but, uh, the leader of this group was a Mrs. Rexworthy. She was from England. Her husband uh, was sent from England. I think he was some kind of an executive in the Hindi Iron Works, which later became Westinghouse, I think. And uh, there were other people, um, people who lived next door to me, the Pringles. They were also from England and came to work at Hindi. So. Um, this was, I don't know when they came, other than probably had something to do with the war effort. I don't know. But anyway, this group of women met on a regular basis and uh, raised money. They had all kinds of uh, fundraising things that they, they kept it going. First of all, they, they, they wanted to become more of a church. And so, um, so we, we uh, talked to the bishop and said we wanted a clergyman all the time because we figured that was the way that the church would grow. So the bishop came down and uh, we had a big party for the bishop. And we had, uh, I remember there was no kitchen. So somebody had a big um, oven thing that you could plug in, I guess. And, uh, and it was filled with scalloped potatoes. So I think that was a hot thing we had, you know, <laughs> so, but, but we impressed the bishop enough so that, that he did eventually send us a, a student, uh, Kenneth Ede. And uh, he was the first real clergyman that they had had for many, many years. And he graduated while he was there and, and uh, very soon after that married his wife, who was Doris, really nice lady, a young woman. She and I drove down to Carmel one time for the UTO meeting. And while we were in the car, she said, you know, since Kenneth started wearing the, the collar, he's a much safer driver than he had been before. <laughs> yes, everybody's watching now. <laughs> I think the most interesting thing that I remember, though, is that, that it was this group of women who kept things going, you know, and uh, they were a very formidable group. Uh, very dedicated and uh, very clever in all the things that they managed ways of raising money and so forth and but they were so faithful you know over all those years and they they had a good time they loved each other every meeting we had to pay a dues of 10 cents i remember and uh, we had tea and one time mrs rexworthy was a very impressive lady as i told you and she had a lovely home on Arbor Street in Los Altos, kind of on a hill. And we went there for tea one time with Colonel Gilmore. And I remember as a, as a kid being so impressed with, with 
but the way she served tea, it was so elegant. She was like the queen, you know, she reminded me of the queen. She had come in, I think in the twenties there. So she had been there a long time, but she was uh, very proper and she had a beautiful um, grand piano, Rosewood grand piano. And I was just so impressed with her and with, the, with all the ladies. So you raised your family in that church then? No, Jim and I only lived there until about 1951, the end of 1951. Mm -hmm. So most of the growth that happened, happened after we left. Mm -hmm. We went to Livermore and uh, I and two friends, I, I was full of confidence after, you know, getting the bishop to Sunnyvale. So uh, two other women that I worked with, we decided we wanted a church in, in uh, Livermore. And so we knocked on doors and finally got the bishop to take notice and we eventually got St. Bartholomew's, so. So there was no church there at all? And no. You and your spouse and other um, women knocked on doors to, to see what the interest was or yeah. you... mm -hmm. okay. see if we could get any what kind of support there was because we contacted the bishop and he said well if you get x 40 people or whatever it was to uh, be interested and willing to pay money and uh, i remember we had one person who worked at uh, the livermore lab dr montgomery and he he gave a hundred dollars or something. And so, I mean, we were launched, you know, that was really something. So, and we held, uh, we held meetings at the Forester's Hall. And on Sundays, we would have to go around and, and uh, hide the spittoons and turn all the girly magazines to the wall <laughs> so we could have a meeting, so. <laughs> the early churches were very interesting. And, very challenging for, for young people, you know, and there were lots of young people in Sunnyvale, uh, you know, about that time, uh, there was, uh, there were people coming to Moffat Field who were in the Navy, and they got interested in the church. So, so, you know, about that time, you know, it began to start, things started happening, lots of churches were coming on, and Bishop Block was wonderful at raising money, he had a, had a way of of uh, coming up with lots of funds for all these things to get started. What are some of the most dramatic things you've seen change in your time of watching the church and being a part of the church? It's more uh, non-traditional. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, when, uh, when the church, the bishop or somebody decided that we wouldn't have uh, morning prayer that we would have communion every Sunday. I remember there was one man in the church walked out. I mean, this is not church. You know, he was furious. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, and I, and I, you know, I still miss morning prayer with, I love the language and everything. That's why I go to eight o'clock. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I got used to having communion all the time, but it's just, it's just different, you know. It's not bad, it's not good, it's just different. Mm -hmm. so you, have, you have to change with the times, so. Mm -hmm. But I, I do um, think it's important to remember our roots and what we, where we came from, you know, and, and to remember that the reason we're here and we can do what we do is because there were other people who, who tried really hard and didn't know what was going to happen. You know, early on, our people would say, you know, we've been a, we've been in mission for thirty years. What are we? What can we do? You know, but somebody thought of something. You know, mm. I remember it was in the seventies that we had a some kind of a Bible class or something, and we were all sitting around, and they they decided that we would pray out loud, and everybody in the circle was said, "Pray out loud! This is incredible." <laughs> I mean, actually out loud <laughs> in a group <laughs> it was it was quite a change so you know that is so interesting because uh i don't actually know sometimes 
what the culture of Episcopalianism was like then? Yeah, well, you know, society is different. There's so, there's so I was going to say women are in different places, but uh, but actually it was the women who kept things going in, in, in Sunnyvale. So it isn't that women had, didn't, weren't doing anything. It's just that nobody paid any attention to them. That is uh, very powerful what you say about uh, people who are thinking about the future, who are building a church and uh, keeping it going. And it seems to me that you, every generation has to keep building the church and uh, preparing for its future because uh, it, it's just not an automatic reality, you know. Uh, and no. it takes a lot of faith, a lot of faith about uh putting something good out there the thing is that that they had they weren't there wasn't one person they all did it together you know and they and they loved doing it you know and when they when they did something happen and the bishop came i mean whoa we we're progressing somebody somebody knows we're here it's just exciting you know so but no although there were some like mrs rex where they were real leaders in the group too but but it was, uh, people did it because they thought it was important and they loved the people around them that they were all helping each other. You know? and so the, this uh, book that the presiding bishop wrote, Love is the Way, you know, it's, it's really, if you think about it, it's really true that the people do things not because they're going to get something out of it because, but because they want to put something into it, which is pretty exciting. Mm. So uh, what message would you give to all the people who will continue to be St. Thomas uh, even after your time? What would you say? Hang in there. Mm. It's, um, you know, you can't always see what's, what's ahead, but something is, and if you, if you do your part and you work together, you'll get somewhere and it'll probably be a good place because you're all doing it together.